Uh, this session um, is going to, as I had noted before the break, it's going to focus in on just making sure we're all on the same page with respect to dynamic modeling. Uh, occasionally I'll do this prior to giving a first conceptual talk like I just did. And I had sort of mixed feelings about delivering that before seeing these models. For someone who's never encountered a dynamic model before, it can seem kind of disorienting to be talking about, you know, models capture theory of the world, they operationalize it in a way that helps us explicate it, help us ask what if questions and, and, and uh, you know, test that theory with respect to empirical data. That may seem kind of airy-fairy. Um, hopefully, um, by getting you in front of some models, those not previously familiar with them will start to have a more concrete sense of what's meant by that um, in this session. At the same time, we'll, we will be going through some conceptual material just to orient you with respect to three sets of three types of models. So um, in order to do this, I'm going to share my screen, okay? And um, uh, what I'm going to try to do here is to orient you with respect to any logic. So I'd suggested those who would like to follow along with any logic are welcome to do so. I've called up any logic um, and this is the, the sort of type of splash screen that many of you will get. It may come in, different colors and be different in this particular. But um, uh, if you call up any logic for the first time, you may see this. If so, you can use that little button there to the upper left to, to minimize it. And so I'm gonna go back to that. Oh no, um, hey, come on there. It's this little button there, okay. Um, and this one here. And if you minimize it, you'll probably see something like this. Um, uh, and then um, we'll be using this menu up here um, to load in models and use them. And I'll explain some of these windows later, okay? Um, uh, but I just wanted to be able to get us to a place where we'll be able to open these. Um, and uh, soon we'll be coming back to this. Okay, so, um, for this session, uh, I'm going to be talking about three types of dynamic modeling. And um, uh, I did put up slides on this. Uh, they should be posted to the site. So if you want to grab them, um, you can read, read about them. And I had noted in my previous talk that, look, simulation models can be thought of as kind of representing hypothesized causal relationships between diverse factors. Um, I'm oversimplifying a bit. There are some models that are just kind of um, tools for, they don't really take a stance on what's going on in the world. They just help us think through, if we had this situation, what would be the implications of processes interacting in these ways? What are, what are the dynamic implications, the implication of behavior over time of that? But a lot of models represent sort of working hypotheses about causal relationships out there in the world or kind of abstractions of them. They kind of mimic things out there in the world. Um, they provide a way of saying what's going on out there in the world. And, and um, they provide a way to kind of examine system-wide consequences of changes in one or more areas of the system. We're dealing with these systems that are coupled I had said earlier, what goes on in a physician's office with respect to opioid prescriptions pops out in, you know, police calls, EMS calls, ED room visits, you know, who's in the hospital wards. Um, it has these kind of dramatic uh, uh, ramifications across the system. And models provide us a way of representing this, and, and they help us to, to, to understand things about this system that can help us make um, better you know, uh, better choices um, and to learn more quickly about a system. Models, to, to dive down a little bit more, all of these three, all these three modeling types we'll be examining depict behavior of a system over time. Um, and this is a situation where we can't just write down an 
a formula for how that behavior will, uh, an equation for how that behavior will take place over time. Um, no, 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 it's, they're nonlinear systems. So we, we, we can't do that. We have to simulate it out. We have to run it. We have to enact it. Um, but, but all these share some common feature that there's a current situation in the model, what we call the state of the system, and it changes over time. It describes, to use the word of David Jazz Myers, what can be, what the current situation is, and how the system changes, um, how that situation changes based on what is the case right now. Um, uh, they specify incremental changes. They say, given the current situation, how is the system changing? The ways in which they describe those incremental changes will differ quite a lot between these three methods. Sometimes it's probabilistic, sometimes it's based on rates of change. But, but they all basically say, given the current situation, how do things change? Um, and the behavior of the system that emerges is, we, uh, is emergent, it's generated. We can't predict ahead of time exactly what it will look like in general. Um, uh, and because the systems in the world typically have nonlinear characteristics, so, so do the models. And that has deep implications, it means we have to simulate it over time. It means we, if we want to understand two different interventions, how they affect things together, we can't just simulate each, find the benefit of each, and then total up the benefits across them. We have to simulate them actually together, interacting, because they may work at cross purposes or may synergize or dinergize, et cetera. Um, and for all these types of models, there's this, there's this need to reason about three types of things. What's endogenous? What's produced by the model? What's generated by the model? What is the model producing? What's exogenous? What's just told to the model, pre-specified? You know, we tell it to the model, assume this over time uh, for unemployment rate or for, you know, availability of, uh, of, of uh, vaccine or what have you, um, versus things that are ignored. Um, so all three of them have to share these characteristics. And yet all three look very different. Um, they, what they have in common, I would argue, um, is, is, is so much more important than their differences. But they are different, and they're different only merely in terms of how they're phrased, the formalisms that are used. They're different in terms of the questions that they're commonly used to pursue. Um, and I'm, I'll try to, to talk about this um, in, in coming minutes, but um, the three types of, I'm going to term system dynamics or compartmental modeling. It goes actually by many names. ODE models, differential equation models, mathematical models is sometimes used as, as sort of a more general grouping that commonly includes this system dynamics models. Um, is an approach you get from a very particular philosophy of modeling. Agent-based modeling, um, which is a close cousin of uh, uh, micro simulation modeling, also goes by individual-based modeling, and discrete event simulation, really it should be called simulation, um, um, which is uh, another type that's commonly undertaken at an individual level, but focuses on resource limited service workflows. Um, so it's focused particularly on service delivery level um, level concerns. So we're going to jump into each of those. And, and I'm going to load in a a model for each of these um, to sort of explicate it. For one, we may load in more than one model. Okay, so what's what's this this first one? I'm gonna I'm gonna call it system dynamics. And, and system dynamics is a is a very specific tradition within compartmental modeling that brings a certain perspective and methodology that's broader actually than just ODE models. So though there it's I mean than ordinary differential quite equation models, compartmental models. So though they're its main tool of choice. Um, it's an evolving methodology to help conceptualize, describe, analyze, and manage 
feedback systems. And it really focuses on feedback and, and accumulations. And it has qualitative and quantitative components to it. Um, we'll be talking in this boot camp on the quantitative components, but it, it bears noting this as qualitative component, which is often used in a participatory context uh, to great effect. Um, but it has this rigorous mathematical foundation based on differential equations um, and, and a rich set of analysis that, that has been advanced for that, including things like eigenvalue elasticity analysis, loop gain analysis, uh, and, and analyses based on, on equilibria points, et cetera. Um, uh, it's supported by software that's designed to allow you to focus on what is being described and less and on how it is being simulated. And a central theme in this area is broadening mental models that are too constricted. System dynamics as a discipline tends to really emphasize um, people's uh, cognitive limitations, their wetware limitations, uh, this perspective of models as learning tools and and in the need to sort of challenge mental models with, with simulation models, with system dynamics models. And there's you know, good reasons this is really emphasized in health because we have many historic cases of blowback where people's mental models were too narrow and they ended up being broadsided by results that uh, if only they had thought more broadly about the situation, they might've been able to, to head off. Um, I won't go into this, um, but it's, it's up to you'll find me, find me speaking about in other contexts. Um, and I had noted this sort of diagram where from a system dynamics perspective, we're always refining our mental model by engagement with the model, by engagement with the world and challenging that model with observations from the world. Um, uh, this is real emphasis on feedback structure of a system and accumulations as, as a cause for inertia delay, et cetera. And it's, it has many different applications within health. Within the mathematical epidemiology area, models like this, while strictly not typically pursued within the dynamic, the discipline of system dynamics, uh, you know, have contributed uh, hundreds, if not thousands of models. Um, the work of Anderson and May, Infectious Diseases of Humans, is kind of a Bible of, of, of such models applied to infectious diseases. But the fact is, there have been models of this sort applied in, in many different areas. And many make use of participatory approaches, people with lived experience, patient-oriented research, um, an area in which I'm very involved. Um, so I'll, I'll just give a glimpse of the, the qualitative components of this, which um, have their own powerful logic. They're, they may seem for quantitative modelers like just a bit of, uh, you know, sort of niceties, but the fact is that you can get really powerful insights out of, out of these sorts of semi-qualitative models, what's called a causal loop diagram. Um, and uh, here we have two different variables, um, one variable hunger, another variable food ingested. And we draw a link from the first variable to the second, A to B, hunger to food ingested. Um, and the, the polarity of the link indicates the nature of that influence. This is a positive causal influence. If we're hungry, we eat more food. So it's a positive one. If hunger goes up, all other things being equal, food ingested will go up um, uh, compared to the value it otherwise would have had. But notice that there's a link from food ingested back to hunger here. As food goes ingested goes up, hunger uh, will also change, but it will tend to go down compared to the value it otherwise would have had, all those other things being equal. So if we get more food, we'll tend to have to eat, we'll have to be less hungry. And so it's associated with a negative polarity. And, and these combine to form this negative feedback loop. And what that means is it's, it's kind of self-limiting. As hunger goes up, there's a regulatory process by which food is ingested and hunger will be limited and, and, and brought back down and under control. Um, this is a, what's called a negative feedback loop. And there's many examples that hopefully we put into place and hopefully with a learning health system, 
you know, we make mistakes, we learn from them, and it lowers our mistakes. Um, um, sometimes these these problems are not desirable. Like we have an emergency waiting times that are too long. It increases the likelihood someone will leave without being seen. And that means our queue is smaller, but we haven't delivered, you know, we haven't delivered value to that patient. Feedback loops of this sort are of fundamental kind of interest in the system dynamics uh, sub area of, of compartmental modeling. Um, and, and the loops indicate feedbacks. Um, um, and there can be uh, negative feedbacks as we've looked at or balancing. There can also be these reinforcing feedbacks, which can be viewed as, as, as desirable. Like if you're trying to sell product, you want to grow the company as quickly as possible. You have success in your product. You have more word of mouth sales more it goes viral on social media and you get more sales yet. That's what companies often want and it can lead to gangbuster growth. But you know, there's, there's also cases where it can lead to addiction, for example, associated with smoking. And it's associated with this sort of divergent behavior. By contrast, these sort of negative feedbacks that like we've talked about tend to lead to balancing behavior, stabilizing behavior. This is destabilizing behavior, this is stabilizing behavior. And when you have a long delay associated with some of these, you can get um, you can get these oscillations, which we see all around us in industrial processes, in health, uh, you know, uh, impacts of health, and oscillations with the spread of COVID nineteen, um, and in in health service delivery. Um, so these types of, of 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 qualitative models that I'm showing here. Um, these are not simulatable, but they are very useful for reasoning about behavior and they're associated with this kind of archetypical behavior. Um, but I wanna, I wanna focus on quantitative system dynamics. As much as, in as much as this can be very insightful, what, what we're really talking about in this boot camp is quantitative system dynamics. And here we distinguish between two types of quantities within system dynamics and compartmental modeling can make use of the same uh, distinction. Um, one is the, what are called stocks or levels, uh, state variables, they're also called um, uh, mathematically. And uh, here, these, these represent accumulations. Um, I'd like to, to load in a model like this so you can actually see it and, and run it if you'd like to. So, so let's go over. I'm, I'm going to sort of pause this there, and, and we're going to go over, and we're going to go back to any logic if you want to follow along. And what I've done here is, is to put up some models um, uh, into this area. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just going to have to go drag a window here um, uh, into um, uh, back into the, um, uh, into here. Okay, so under participant resources, this is to what you have access to. There should be an example models folder. Okay, now um, what I'm going to ask you to do here will be uh, to uh, download these models. Um, and in order to download them, I'm gonna try to walk you through this. Um, it involves a little bit of, um, of, of uh, uh, trying things out on your part. So what I'm going to ask you to do is to um, go to this place, example models. And there's two ways you could do it. You could either go here um, and say download, and that will download a zip file, which you can then unpack on your local computer. If you feel comfortable um, doing that, um, that is an option. There's a bit of a delay in it, which can be, um, can make it, you know, take a little bit of time. But if you feel comfortable going and then opening that zip file, going here and saying open Sesame, um, extract here. Um, and I go to example models and, oh, sorry, I went to the wrong. I no, I don't want to go to that one. I want to go to this one. Here are all my three models right there in my download file. If, if you don't want to do that and you want to download them one by one, um, I'll walk you through this. And I, I wanna walk you through this because uh, it'll be useful not only for this session, but other sessions. So 
forgive me if, if I'm um, uh, going to take a little bit of time. You can right click on it and say download. Okay. Um, and that will download that particular model. Um, and often that's a bit easier than dealing with this zip file. So I'm going to download all, all three of these. Okay. Um, let's suppose it didn't say that. Um, well, if, if, you, if you go click on this, you'll see something horrible in front of you. Um, secretly, for anyone who wants to know, this is what's called an XML file, mumble, mumble. But, um, uh, but don't be scared by it if, if, if you're not sure what it is. Um, there's up in the upper right-hand corner, there should be something like download. That's another way to do it, OK? So just in case there's no nice down menu, you can always click through kind of, if you don't mind the, the aesthetic front, and you can say download. And it will download it to your computer, OK? Um, there you go. Um, OK, so I've just shown three ways to download. Let me count the ways. Number one, I showed a zip file, which you could download through this. It would zip. and by downloading the zip, you can unpack it and engage in it. Secondly, you can go click here and do download. Thirdly, if for some reason uh, you, those don't work, you can click on this and do download. Um, over the years, we've had people do it those three ways. Um, OK, good question. To open the file, once you've taken it down there, we're going to use any logic. OK, so what you can do is you don't have to like open it from there. If you go to any logic here, you can go file, open, and go find the file that you've downloaded. And there they are. They stand before me. Um, so I'm going to open this up and it's going to say mumble something. Um, so I'm just, it's because I already had it open. And so I'm going to open it. Um, uh, here and it will load it into any logic. Um, but let me make sure. Um, oh, yeah. So if you haven't already downloaded any logic, I had sent instructions for how to download it. So if you have downloaded any logic, you can do what I just did um, file, open, and then go grab the file, say open, and it will open it up. Um, but if you haven't downloaded any logic, Wade is hopefully put in the uh, um, put in the link there. Any any anyone want to raise a question here before we go on? Remember, you could always call out for TA help as well. Anyone? Okay, if people are feel comfortable. This, what stands before us is a, is a model in this tradition, compartmental modeling or system dynamics modeling. Um, uh, so these are what are called the stocks or state variables. They describe collectively, they describe at any one time, what's the situation? There are a certain number of people in the susceptible state, a certain number of people in the state of latent infection. They've gotten infected, but they're not yet infective. Um, there's a set of people who are infective or equally infectious, set of people who are recovered. Um, uh, beyond that, um, there's a set of people who are hospitalized and a number of cumulative deaths. This cumulative death is just kind of acting to, to accumulate it. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it a bit bigger to make it less bad. You'll notice you can interact with this. Um, then there's a set of vaccinated people, a set of cumulative hospitalizations and, and cumulative infections. These, these uh, state the current situation. Remember I, I said all dynamic models have a current situation, what we call state, and these collectively characterize that state. Mm. And then there's changes to the state, these things called flows, okay? That's, that's like, this is a flow. That's, you can think of the stocks, these is kind of the nouns of the system. These are the, these flows are kind of the verbs. That's where the action is taking place. So infections are occurring over time. Recoveries are occurring over time, uh, et cetera. Um, and 
these represent change in the system. Um, people who were infectious are becoming recovered. Um, and, that, and that change occurs at a certain rate. There's a certain number of people here who go from infectious to recovered per unit time. So per unit time, which in this case is a day, I, to see that it clicked up here, day. Um, uh, I, I say it's the number of infectious people divided by the mean time infectious. Um, so if, if people on average spend 10 days infectious, then approximately one tenth of them, of the people here in the infectious stock, the infectious number, there's a thousand people here and it takes 10 days to recover, then approximately a hundred of them will leave per day. Um, is the idea. Um, uh, so one tenth of them will leave per day. Um, so it's infectious divided by this. And each of these form, each of these flows has a formula associated with it. Each of the stocks is an initial value, some number of people that start there. This one started initial value zero. And in fact, susceptible started Everyone started susceptible except those in the vaccinated or exposed state. And we had one person, one person started in the exposed state and, and the rest started in the vaccinated. Uh, and, uh, of, of those who weren't susceptible, the rest of them started in the vaccinated state. Um, so, so this is a model. Um, it's a kind of describes a operational theory about, um, how infection spreads here and how there's a natural history of infection and some people are hospitalized and some people die. It describes kind of an operationalized theory to explain patterns of change over time. People progress through infection and if they're vaccinated, um, they, they can't be infected is the idea here. Clearly not true for COVID-19. Um, uh, some people, uh, who are exposed go on to a state without requiring hospitalizations. Other go on to a state who are hospitalized where the difference is given by this fraction of being hospitalized. My goal is not to teach this whole language. It's just to convey to you that this is kind of an operationalized theory. This is a language for saying, given the current situation, the number of people in each of these states, how does the situation change? Well, some people are recovering and some people are getting infected and some people are being admitted to the hospital. That's what this language allows us to say. Given the current situation, how does the situation change in response? Now, why, do, why would we do that? Well, maybe we wanna run, run some question, you know, run some scenarios. So if you go over here, given this kind of theory, we can run these experiments. That's why there's an X here, these scenarios. Each of these describes a what if situation. If we ran with this model, what might we expect to see with certain assumptions about parameters? Um, so we're gonna run this baseline wild type, um, um, which is describing um, uh, sort of a spread, a spread of infection with a certain set of of assumptions. How did I run that? What I did is I right clicked here and I said run. And on Max, it's uh, option click. Wade, help me. Is it option click? Um, uh, or 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 uh, Alt Command click. Thank you, Wade. I don't know how many times you'll have to tell me. Um, okay, so uh, Command click. You can you can do Command click on this. Um, uh, and you can choose run. You can actually do it up here as well, run from here, but you'll have a, a lot of choices. Um, and you can also do it from here and you also have a lot of choices, but I like to click on it here, right click on it there, choose run, and up will come this screen, which is this model running. And the model will be running, people will be getting infected per unit time, people will be recovering per unit time. Um, 
And you'll notice that there's some number of count of infectious people and count of hospitalized people. Now this is going rather slowly. Um, if we open the side panel, we're only up to like day 30. You can speed it up by pressing this and time runs quicker and, and the pandemic spreads and, and you know, there's growing numbers of people getting infected and people are hospitalized and there's some number of cumulative deaths. And then the pandemic peaks in terms of number of people infected and, and the count hospitalized, currently hospitalized goes down um, and, and we can follow its progress. We can also click on these and ask to see a sort of graph of each of them separately to show you know, how have things progressed thus far. And, and we can um, simulate that out and see what the effects are. Okay, um, so this is, a, this is a compartmental model or, or system dynamics model. It describes a kind of theory about this situation, describes how the system changes given how it is, um, and, uh, and allows you to ask what if questions about it. This is one of these three types of modeling. And we're gonna go back to the, um, uh, go back to the slides here to continue on our exposition. So there are these stocks, we saw them, right? Susceptible, exposed, infectious, or what have you. Um, and those describe the state of the system. Um, uh, they're really central to understand like why we see oscillations or why we see um, decay and memory. And they lead to inertia and give rise to delays in the system. Um, delays where it requires a while to, to catch up or for a new investment in services to yield effect. Often it's because of these stocks, these, you know, there's a certain number of people who are still in a situation affected by the old system, et cetera. Flows were those changes between it, it was recovery and infection, et cetera. They were expressed per unit time. They were, they were describing the number of people who are recovering per unit time. It was this divided by the mean time infectious. Um, so it might be 100 per day that are infected. If it was 10 days on average, they spent infected. Um, and 1,000 of them were there. Um, these flows are kind of the action, or the verbs uh, associated with this uh, system. Um, and it turns out this can be characterized as a set of what are called ordinary differential equations, ordinary first order differential equations. And um, there's beautiful mathematics behind this, um, but there's beautiful intuition behind it here. And an important thing to realize is that stocks determine the stock, the value of the stocks now, the value of the number of people in here who are infectious, for example, de determines the number that are recovering per unit time. The number that are susceptible and the number that are infectious jointly determine the number of getting infected per unit time. If there was none of the infectious people, no one would be getting infected. If there were no susceptibles, nobody would get infected. So, um, what we have is a situation where stocks, the current state of the system determines the flows, but the flows dictate how quickly the stocks are rising or falling. Um, and if you have a given stock, like if you have the infectious stock, if more people are coming in per day than are leaving per day, just like if bath water is coming into your bathtub faster than it's leaving, it'll tend to go up. If water is coming into your sink faster than the drain can let it go out, it will tend to rise. Um, then, then this will will rise. Um, by contrast, if more people are recovering than are than are coming in through new infections here, then infectious will go down. And there's this beautiful intuition involving this to parse the situations to understand what's going on in the world by looking at these quantities, you can get a lot of insight into what is this telling us about you know, um, the, the underlying situation because we look at these values of the stocks and we reason about their inflows and outflows, uh, people coming in, people leaving. Um, 
Now, if we want to capture heterogeneity, we can't want to capture different infection rates in low income versus high income groups, for example. We commonly stratify a model. So we, we kind of have different layers of a model. They're not solitudes, but they're different layers. So we'll have susceptibles who are low income, exposed, low income, infected, low income, recovered, low income. And then we'll have another layer of susceptibles who are high income, so exposed, high income, infected. But they're not solitudes because one can infect the other. And, and we can capture that in a way I won't go into. There's emergent behavior that, that comes out in response to this. Maybe, maybe I'll illustrate this by again going back to our model. And there's a thing called baseline wild type over 10 years. I'm going to run that. It's, it's a longer time horizon. It's not just one year, it's 10 years. So I'm going to run it. How did I do that? I right clicked on it and I chose run. Mm. Okay, here we go. So here I'm going to run it. And here I see the pandemic playing out. I'm clicking this to speed it up. It, it comes out the number of people infectious is still rising. Oh, now it's going down again. It's going down. It looks like the infection is going away. It looks like it's 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 disappearing. And so it's spending a long time very low. A nice summer is happening. Um, a hot vac summer is occurring. Uh-oh, look what's going on now. It's coming up and then it's going down again. Um, so the number of infectious didn't stay down. We didn't have a fix that stayed fixed. Now it's rising again and falling again. Um, so now we're getting oscillations. Uh, that are occurring. And you notice that they're not going down to zero, uh, to, to that near zero anymore. It's kind of all oscillating within a certain region. When we say emergent behavior, I didn't program in that there will be oscillations. Those emerged from this model through the interaction of all these different features. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. This is about the elephant. It's not that the trunk said there's gonna be oscillations. It's not that the tail said it, it's not that the left ear or the right ear even, um, uh, and not even the left leg said it. it. It somehow came out of the interaction of all these factors, ba-boom, there were these oscillations. It wasn't pre-programmed in, it emerged. It was an emergent property. And these emergent properties with these sorts of models, like with any of the types of models we're talking about, can be very rich. You can see these sort of unexpected behaviors over time. You can see tipping points, these sort of situations where, again, if you just push it a little bit more, the situation changes radically. It's a night and day difference. Um, you can see lock-in effects, cases where, you know, the infection can either be extinct or if it gets out of control, it can go up and stay up permanently. You know, um, very high levels of obesity or very high levels of, of, um, of, of suicidal ideation and, and depression and anxiety in the population or high levels uh, associated with, um, with uh, you know, gonorrhea and chlamydia in a population uh, with STIs. Um, and there can be sort of behavior modes that are very, very um, established. Now, one of the things that, um, that are very, very structured and which have interest in behavior, this sorts of modeling, it, it, it affords itself for use with participatory processes. And indeed, a lot of system dynamics is conducted with communities or with groups building models. But there's actually a formal analysis, a lot of insight that could come. And the field of mathematical epi is filled with beautiful types of, anal of analysis of these models that establish these regularities, like long-term behavior and the stability of the system, how to make the system stable. So even if we have you know, a busload of people come into Saskatchewan infected by you know, COVID, um, there won't be an outbreak or by pertussis or what have you. Um, so we can conduct this formal analysis. And what we're going to see in this boot camp is how this is combined with machine learning. These sorts of models are, because of their formal structure, because of their computational simplicity, et cetera, they're ideal tools to combine with machine learning. And we can use it to capture behavior that is constantly regrounded by observations from the world 
and realigned with observations in the world and learning from observations about the world, like about parameter values, et cetera. Take into account the fact that observations are fallible and model is fallible. We're constantly balancing these and getting a distribution of expectations and interpreting the whole, whole um, structure of the system. Okay, so, so compartmental model and system dynamics, some notable strengths. Um, I won't emphasize the participatory modeling here. That's a different boot camp, but um, uh, capturing dynamics of continuous variables, it's, it's uh, very powerful, um, rapid model prototyping. Um, you can build it without writing code in a traditional sense. Um, and a capacity to reason more deeply about, about these structures. It has some notable strengths. It has some limitations dealing with heterogeneity so key in many areas like mental health, it really runs into to challenges. Capturing you know, histories of individuals, it really can't do that very well. Um, capturing network structures or spatial locations, it has its real limits. So let's talk about a type of modeling which can do these other things, but has different trade-offs. Agent-based modeling. And as for system dynamics modeling, I wanna illustrate this with an example model that it, that's provided to you. And I'll be providing you know, 80 to 100 models uh, for, your, for your use here probably tonight. Um, so let's, let's, go, let's go find that model if we could, okay? Um, so that model is this model that's called, it's a bit of a mouthful um, as I am want, uh, GIS food and PA is physical activity environment, okay? Um, so if you haven't downloaded that, remember you can do so with this, right clicking or command clicking and choosing download um, is probably the easiest way, but, but I showed you those ways before, so I won't be labor it. So if we go back, we can close this first model if you want to, or you could leave it open and engage in, in, um, in experimentation with it. We do file open. And let's go find that model, GIS, food and environment and PA environment interaction. Um, and I had already loaded it. So it asked me, sure, you wanna load this thing uh, again? I said, yeah. Okay, here we go. Uh, so um, this model is, a, a, um, is an agent-based model. Um, and maybe I'll show you at the cost of it being a buzzing, blooming confusion, I'll first show you it, and then we'll talk, talk about what we've seen. So here um, we load it in, and we already we see a, a map, and we see what look like houses or something on it, and these green. So the green are actually parks. These things that, that are shown, this kind of structure, those are actually supermarkets. Um, and uh, and then there's convenience stores, uh, which are these smaller sort of uh, uh, darker green things. Sorry, sorry for my poor, poor color um, vocabulary. Um, and they're scattered over this landscape. Um, let's go click on person. And we notice that this, this model actually is kind of a theory of personhood, of what it means to be a person in this model. Um, and if, if you look around it, it involves, um, uh, certain certain assumptions about behavior, like they have a home, they have a preference for convenience store meals, a probability of shopping wisely, um, you know whether they go for Tim Tams and um, and and meat pies, or whether they go for um, healthier uh, types of, of fruits and vegetables, um, and and there's some rule about their behavior, rules about their behavior, of how they eat a meal, and and how they engage in food procurement. To what degree do they prefer convenience uh, of a nearby place, for example, versus um, um, going going uh, further away for for supermarket goods? Um, okay, so there's a theory of personhood, um, and uh, maybe we'll we'll run this out. So I'm going to say a baseline, and I'm going to say run here, and what we'll see is is that same um, same situation here. And uh, this is 
Um, this is depicting individuals. You can kind of see them um, going from homes. Those are these blue structures. And they're actually going to uh, supermarkets or visiting convenience stores. And those people are, are lent a certain appearance. They look, um, uh, th th they have a rather um, uh, elliptical appearance. Um, and, but that appearance is not static. So if we, if we speed this up, for example, we'll find that some of them are more lithe than others. Uh, other those of them gather a girth of, of significance. Um, and uh, they are visiting these various stores and parks and their weight is evolving according to some theory of, of weight evolution. Um, the truth is this is a hybrid model and this is a stock and flow model within it. They have some energy expenditure from physical activity influenced by the presence of parks from, um, from uh, basal energy expenditure. And then they have some energy in from uh, food that they, they purchase. Um, and their habits collectively in going and getting food from convenience stores or from these, these supermarkets, which offer a more wholesome variety of foods, um, ends up fate, uh, affecting their weight evolution. Now, um, uh, and, and their um, habits are shaped by their food environment and their physical activity environment. If you scroll up, what you'll see is that um, we plot out here um, for different individuals shown in these orange dots, sort of the fraction of meals they've eaten at convenience stores versus their weight. And you, know, you can see some sort of pattern here. It evolves over time, but there's a pattern. Um, if, we, if we plot them out here, grocery store distance uh, on the X versus weight in kilograms Y, um, uh, we, we, might, we might hope to see some sort of um, uh, some sort of relationship between them uh, that we might capture, say, uh, in a regression. Uh, here, um, we have a ratio of convenience store, their distance to a convenience store versus weight. And so two would mean, um, sorry, it's, it's twice as far to a grocery store as it is to a convenience store. Um, and their weight is on the, the y-axis. Um, so, and broadly, there's an overall sort of upwards uh, pattern here, association. So the further it is to a, to a grocery store compared to the nearest convenience store, the higher their weight will be because they'll be eating an unhealthy number of Tim Tams. Um, and uh, here's, here's a, another graph showing their preference for meals and, and park distance, et cetera. I'm not gonna go into this and clearly we would have more more clarity on these graphs if we had a larger population size. But what this is showing is that we can take what's going on here with these individual actors situated in an environment, affected by that environment, that geography, and we can summarize it uh, statistically at an individual level or a collective level. Um, we can track individual histories we can uh, ask about their characteristics and look at relationships and associations that emerge from this model um, in a way that uh, might be analogized to what we see in empirical data at an individual level, um, you know, data on, on individuals um, itemized out. And, uh, and a model like this indeed allows for this kind of rich reasoning about history and about patterns of heterogeneity over the population. We can associate people with different environments which pose them, pose different challenges to healthy eating or physical activity, et cetera. This is an example of an agent-based model. Um, it's actually a hybrid model. It's a bit of that weight dynamics that was with stock and flow. Let's, let's talk about the principles here. So agent-based models have one or more populations of agents each associated with characteristics. These include fixed parameters, fixed assumptions about them, maybe involving their ethnicity, for example, or what their birth weight was, um, or you know, the, those in their family, for example. Um, but it, can also, it also typically involves their state. In this case, it involved weight, um, weight evolving. Uh, age would be another one. Smoking status might evolve. 
maybe their network is changing. And then critically, there's some actions that change their situation, some things that evolve their state and rules uh, for those actions. And then there's means of interactions with the other agents within the environment. Um, um, you know, in this case, it might be with convenience stores and grocery stores, but in, in many cases, it's with other agents. There's a time horizon and, and characteristics, uh, for example, whether it's stepped or continuous time and, and some initial state. So each person, so in an agent-based model, we might formulate there's some population. And it, when we run the model, that population is say many people here um, in it. Each of those people has characteristics, uh, these parameters, maybe some fixed characteristics. A given person will have certain characteristics. You, you probably are starting to realize in contrast to compartmental or system dynamics modeling, we can very readily here examine heterogeneity, differences separating people, you know, differences between people, differences that are, are categorical, um, like people's ethnicity or differences that are, uh, or, or you know, sex at birth or what have you, or, or they're, continuous, things like income level. Um, we can have people associated with continuous differences, which, which is not, not in general possible with a compartmental model like we've seen without going to what's called a partial differential equation. Um, people here can have, will have state in general and rules for evolving state. So we might have a state whether a given individual is pregnant or not, um, for example, um, or whether they're their status with respect to COVID-19 infection or with respect to separately COVID-19 and flu um, or their status with respect to attitudes um, with respect to care seeking, for example. Um, uh, so for those struggling with this for the first time, stock and flow models um, and, and agent-based modeling have kind of, one is, Hegel once, uh, Marx once said about Hegel that he, he, he took him uh, and flipped him on his head and that's all he did. But um, here, you know, it's kind of like aggregate stock and flow models and agent-based models are almost, they, they're, one is the flip side of the other in a way. Um, it's, it's kind of turned on its side. Um, so within aggregate models, we saw it before, stock and flow. Like that model of remember with hospitalization and accumulated deaths and number of people currently infected. Here we we describe a population by dividing it up into these bins, into these compartments, these accumulations. And each of them characterizes the number of people in that in that bin, the number of susceptibles, the number of exposed, the number of infected people. That's, that's what we do. And, and so the, the model is organized, it's subdivided by, it's, it's, it's organized by their state and their characteristics. If we needed susceptible low income and susceptible high income, those would be two separate compartments. Um, so it's organized according to their characteristics. Um, and we count the data as we count the number of people in each. Within an agent-based model, it's very different. If we kind of zoom in and we, we go look, okay, this is composed of, of individual people. Here, the model is subdivided, not by, not by sort of their characteristics. No, 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 no. It's subdivided by individuals. It's subdivided by particular people. I mean, by, by these folks, it's, it's, that's the unit of organization. It's not, it's not into these sort of compartments where we count. And, in each of these units, each of these people maintains their own state. They, it'll maintain whether they're open to care or not, or whether they're susceptible, exposed, infected or not, um, uh, et cetera. Um, and we can have nested relationships here, with, which is like a person is in a family, and a family is in a neighborhood, and a neighborhood is in a city. For example, we can we can have that very conveniently within an agent-based model, in a way that's really not not readily achievable with existing aggregate stock and flow models. Um, maybe with compositional modeling down the road.
So with the agent-based modeling, um, um, we also put a premium on interacting with the other agents. Um, I didn't really emphasize that in the model I, I showed you, but you know, in general, we might have a contact network between people, maybe people within a family or coworkers, or maybe there are people who share needles in a needle sharing network involving uh, use of, uh, of, of narcotics, for example. Um, and, uh, and then there's emergent behavior. And, and we noticed in stock and flow models, we saw emergent behavior. Remember those waves of infection we saw, for example, or the rise and the fall of the number of infectives. Those weren't pre-programmed in, but they were an important part of what the system produced. In agent-based models, we have all those over time, but we have more than that. We have patterns over space and patterns over networks. Um, so we might see an interaction like this. This is actually from a model of prion-based infection with chronic wasting disease, um, where we see um, deer circulating and they're depositing prions where they're, uh, if an infected deer is, is shedding prions when they're eating or you know, in, in defecation or urination, they're spreading prions. And we can see emergent patterns not, not pre-programmed in with respect to where prions um, are you know, gathered at, at high amounts uh, within, this, within this model. It's an emergent pattern. We also have patterns over, over time with respect to the number of infected deer, for example. And we'll often see these patterns in space and patterns in networks, for example. Um, this is a, a network involving physicians and patients, uh, for example, um, uh, and in emergent patterns uh, in them. Okay, um, so in agent-based models, uh, important for later in this, in this boot camp, you should realize agent-based models are stochastic typically, not invariably. There are things like the Conway's game of life that are deterministic, but by and large, overwhelmingly, they tend to be stochastic. Why is that? Well, amongst other things, if you're depicting behavior at an individual level, that's typically, you're not going to be able to predict that deterministically. It'll be, it'll be characterized stochastically. It's a tendency to, to act a certain way. You're more likely to go to the convenience store if it's close by, but you're not always going to the convenience store. Sometimes you're going to the grocery store and getting a bunch of groceries together. Um, to in, in, when you have stochastics, um, that has a, a bunch of implications, but one of them is to ensure that model results that you look at are, are not happenstance, not flukes, um, just chance. You run the model many times, and then you get a, a, a distribution out of, of results. You run what's called an ensemble of these models, and you see a distribution of, of outcomes for these. And those can be run in parallel, um, and we look at maybe a collection of 100 such runs, um, all with the same assumptions, but just trying to make sure that we don't um, overstep ourselves in thinking you know, that there's a pattern there when it's just, just chance from one or two of them. Um, and, and this is useful because the behavior we see from the world is often stochastic as well, but it requires running the model many times. And if we We'll get to it later, but if we calibrate the model, if we try to align it with data, we need to do so, take into account the fact that it's stochastic. So if we run the model once, we'll see certain results out, a certain number of people who have gotten infected over time at any time, this is time here, or a certain number by the final time that have gotten infected among low socioeconomic group or high, but, if we run it many times, we'll see, oh, that's just one of many possibilities. And most that's the single most likely uh, one for this is here, but it, both high SES and low SES have, have, a, have a number here. In fact, that's even more than this one. And then there's a distribution, but the low SES distribution, the distribution you tend to see in low SES cases tends to be much higher in, in terms of case counts than for, for low S, oh, sorry, than for high SES. This is low SES, this is high. And they're distributions of outcomes. That's what you get after running these models out many, many times. 
Um, right, and, and we can capture hierarchical context. These might be cities and each city has a population and the populations of contacts within cities and people move between cities. That's all relative, uh, easy to capture. So what are some strengths of ABMs? Well, they capture continuous and discrete heterogeneity. They can represent network, spatial context, multi-level nesting. Um, they can capture situated decision-making, cases where my decision-making, say about where I go to get food or how much physical activity I get is based on my environment, my food environment, my physical activity environment, the nearest park or the behavior of people around me in my family, in my neighborhood or the crime rate right around me. These are things we can capture. We can capture learning on the part of agents, adapting a behavior. Um, beyond this though, um, there's a, a set of longitudinal information we can accumulate on persons um, in an agent-based model that we can't in that first type of modeling we looked at, the compartmental modeling. If we go back to that, um, to that first type of model, um, which you may remember looked like this, at any one time, what this gives is a cross-sectional depiction of the population. It counts the number of people here right now, the number of people here at that time here, and it tells you how that evolves over time. That's very rich. It says how the number of infectious people, you know, uh, evolves in parallel with the number of exposed and susceptible. That's great, but what it doesn't tell you is: are the people who are infectious now the same people as who were infected a year ago? Um, or is it just they got infected and they recovered and they came back and it's the same ones again and again, as we see all the time in healthcare, right? With hot spotting techniques and so on. Like 20, 30, 40, even 40% of some ED visitations might be um, from a small subset of high acuity patients, you know, people with high number of chronic conditions, complex patients, people with mental health and addictions needs. And this doesn't tell you that. This doesn't tell you, are they the same people? It just counts the number. It's 100 people now, maybe it was 100 people a year ago. Is it the same 100? Uh, we can't really, no. We, we don't have a way of, of effectively asking that question or tracing that. Um, but in an ABM, we can't. We could keep track of someone's whole history. We could keep track of the number of times they've been infected and, and their presentation for care, their episodes of care. We can keep track of you know, their past treatments uh, very readily. And we could compare that against longitudinal data from the world, maybe from administrative data, maybe from electronic health records, maybe from um, observational studies uh, tracking individuals over time. Um, we can readily do that in an ABM. Uh, it's part of the, the, the lens of ABM is to be able to resolve that. Um, uh, we can characterize endogenously intervention effects and implementation science concerns involving interventions in a way that really is generally not possible in a rich way in compartmental modeling. You can make some efforts for it, but at a certain point when you're really dealing with highly targeted interventions or you want to, to vary the behavior of the intervention based on a person's history, you know, a, a, a compartmental lens is very difficult to use because you don't have access to that history. Uh, you can't make their STI treatment depend on whether they're a frequent flyer. Um, I think that's no, no longer the approved. I think they're called, uh, uh, what, are, what are they called? Happy faces or something. Um, uh, the people who come in frequently. Um, um, uh, visualization can aid uh, communication. Um, uh, and, and often the stories that can be told by an agent-based model, the visualizations that come from it can be very powerful for engaging with stakeholders. And often stakeholders can relate to the individual level stories that come out of ABM when it's used in a participatory fashion. Um, and finally, with ABM, and importantly for, for um, machine learning and data science, we can take an ABM and use it as kind of a synthetic model of the world where we can test machine learning techniques to infer things about that ABM. It provides us this kind of rich synthetic data set 
where we know the underlying situation with clarity and with certainty. And we can use, we can use that to trial um, strategies for inferring things about the real world population um, and seeing their blind spots, seeing where they fall short, seeing where they succeed, and thereby refine those strategies. That will be very important as part of this intersection of data science and system science, because it helps us craft better data science tools. Um, so ABMs offer some, some strong benefits. In other, other contexts, other lectures, you'll see me hold forth on comparisons between aggregate and individual-based models. The truth is both of them are key. Both of them are incredibly valuable. Each of them can address different needs. There are certain things we can do with aggregate models in terms of formal analysis and, and identifying, um, for example, equilibria or stability that we can't do with individual-based models and vice versa. But let's talk, because time moves on, about discrete event modeling, this or discrete event simulation, this final term. And I, I wanna draw attention here, particularly for those from a background in health service delivery, because discrete event simulation is a tool of choice when we are conducting work that involves characterization of health services. That doesn't mean it's a one size fits all solution. I often feel it's best combined with agent-based modeling to achieve greatest effect, um, but it's a formidable tool for crisply, transparently, expressively characterizing workflows, service workflows in a resource-constrained environment. Um, where someone's progress along here depends on availability of resources. Um, and where you wanna characterize queuing and waiting times and waiting list size, and, and you wanna make it more efficient and deliver value. And you're worried about, about people balking and leaving without being seen and, and resource utilization. This is a, an exceptionally powerful method but it's even more powerful when it can be combined with other techniques. Um, let's talk about it. So, so this technique is different from system dynamics and agent-based modeling in that it's more specialized. It's more crafted to the particular needs of characterizing these service workflows. These service workflows come up all the time in health, in healthcare particularly, but they come up in public health as well, right? Um, when we need to test people for COVID-19, when we need to engage in contact tracing, for example, um, when laboratory processes need to be undertaken with samples, um, um, uh, these, these come up in spades. And um, here we have a workflow that proceeds. An individual flows through it. So maybe it's a patient and they come into a hospital and we need to see if the CAT scan is needed. And, uh, and if so, they have to drink trace medication and then they have to undergo the CAT scan, which is modeled as a hierarchical process. And then we might further be interested in whether they might be um, suffering from pulmonary hypertension and need to undergo a VQ scan or an ultrasound scan. Um, this is a workflow. There's kind of structured rules associated with routing people. And we'll have queues that build up um, and people will flow, flow down here. Um, so um, this, for example, uh, characterizes the flow associated with an emergency room. But you know, I would do you a disservice if I didn't give you the option to interact with one of these directly. So if you have any logic go up, um, this time you actually won't be drawing on one of those models that I've shown you. I, you know, I would suggest you might want to look at that whole person model later, and I'm glad to demonstrate as another rich uh, agent-based model. But here, we'll just go to help, and we'll go back to that, um, to this example models area. So it's under help example models. And if you scroll down here, okay, um, what you'll find is there's a trauma center, okay? Um, and that's referring to uh, a center uh, for, for treating patients um, uh, 
And uh, here, we're gonna have a walk-in area um, and patients will be triaged. Um, and some will be seen in uh, emergency department. Others require x-rays, for example, to, to assess musculoskeletal damage as an express care area. And uh, there'll be resources um, uh, that will limit their, 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 and facilitate their flow through here. Remember when I said that here, um, people's flow through it is resource limited, and there's resource pools that are what we call capacitated, which basically means they're limited by availability of resources. Um, and what we're gonna see is that discrete event modeling allows us to, to represent the impact of these resources on people's processing. And that will ask, allow us to ask questions really nimbly, really readily about what would be the impact if we had more of resource X versus resource Y? Or what if we could somehow coordinate better resources X, Y, and Z? Or what if we placed resources closer to the certain area? We laid out the facility this, this uh, certain place. That's the sort of thing we can look at. So let's go, let's go look at that. So here's this uh, trauma center. Um, and uh, if you go um, open that up, if you double click on main and you go down main, um, uh, what you'll find um, in the lower parts here is um, um, a characterization of the resource limited workflow processes associated with the individuals flowing through the system. So individuals who admire, who enter, for example, with, uh, with walk-in, um, uh, will be triaged um, and uh, they will wait for the triage. You can see there's this little thing there which will indicate Q, um, kind of the end of a Q there. And then they'll go to a waiting room and then they'll need a registrar to be registered in and, and, um, and they'll go down and, and they'll be processed through uh, express care or through x-ray, et cetera. Um, these are a step of, of, of processes. Let's go run this model because I think if you see it, it'll give you a, a better kind of conception of what's going on here. Um, so we can actually view this in either uh, a 2D view or a 3D view. And so I'm gonna click here to, to run this. Um, and you notice you can view it in 2D uh, people coming in, they're going to the waiting room, they're being uh, going to be triaged and, and they're getting registered. Some of them are being brought over here to a room. What's less obvious is they're being brought over in an accompanied way. They've so-called seized a resource. They've required a resource to be brought to a room to be then examined. And they require a room. Um, and you'll notice that there's a count going on in the number of people, for example, who are waiting at any one time or the number that have cumulatively walked in. And we can go see statistics, for example, associated with the uh, distribution of severity or the number of doctors, which are currently these, all the resources, the specialists, the physicians, assistants, the registers, uh, registrars, et cetera. And then there's some limitations in the number of rooms, for example, that are available. Um, and you can see out of this comes emergent statistics, things like the length of stay in minutes uh, for the express care or the emergency department in general. But we can also track where they're spending their time, where are the bottlenecks, where are they backing up, where are the, the long delays, for example, and we can, sort of page through this um, uh, in order to see, you know, where people are stalling. Um, and that might clue us in to certain resources that might be helpful. Um, by, by being so clued in, we might then, uh, for example, start to ask, uh, well, okay, um, with this, uh, these statistics, maybe we could increase the number of doctors and maybe that would end up changing the length of stay distribution, for example. Um, or maybe we wanna change the opening hours of this uh, facility to be open for longer periods of time. How would that change 
the resulting patterns of length of stay um, and potentially you know, change the, uh, the acuity uh, of the situation um, following treatment. Um, so this is an example of a, uh, of a simulation of resource constrained workflow processes um, that can be used as the starting point for asking these uh, and answering these questions involving the impacts of resource placement, resource availability of different sorts, impacts on service delivery time or quality, et cetera. Um, so discrete event simulation is a tool of choice to characterize aspects of service delivery. Um, we often combine it with uh, agent-based modeling, which kind of captures someone out in the population. But um, there's no question that it's formidable when characterizing um, uh, care processes and flows of individuals through um, complex, uh, uh, complex uh, workflows. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, those are the three types of dynamic modeling traditions. Um, I'm not gonna be going into it in this bootcamp. It's more the focus of our August bootcamp, but there's hybrid strategies between them. They're very rich. Agent-based and system dynamics, you actually saw one of those, which I mentioned in Soto Voce, um, where, where we had an agent-based model and a system dynamics model characterizing weight dynamics. But there are many other forms of that that are very rich. Um, uh, discrete event simulation, agent-based modeling, where you can capture agents in the population, but when they present for care, they flow through these resource limited pathways. So some key take home messages from this, um, from this, because um, we're, we're over time here. Models express dynamic hypotheses about the processes underlying observed behavior in the world. They, they allow us to, to take hypotheses and put them into an operational form to describe what's going on in the world out there with a with structure that mimics that structure in the world. These generative pathways that we posit are kind of driving the system out there in the world. It's not perfect, but allows us to characterize that operationally and then test it and test the degree to which it is consistent with empirical evidence. Um, if it is found wanting, we revise that theory. The three types of modeling we looked at have different ways of couching that theory. For example, as service constrained workflows for discrete event simulation, for um, here for uh, agent-based modeling, we characterize it with these things called um, um, called state charts. And if I had shown you that third model I posted there, you would have seen richer state charts involving mental health and addictions needs and treatment processes. This is a different way to describe the state of the system and how it evolves over time. Those resource constrained processes did the same thing with a different language, different characterization of the state of the system in a different way for describing given that state, how it evolves. But the theme is the same. And then finally, the, the compartmental or agent or, 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 uh, or system dynamics modeling, again, characterize the state of the system and how it changes over time here. Um, uh, we characterize the state of the system here with, uh, with stocks, and we characterized how it evolves over time with flows, um, where that rate of change associated with the flow is dependent on the state. How it evolves depends on the current situation, um, but uh, where um, that current state is then affected by that evolution in turn. Um, now, having done that, these models in whatever form, these dynamic models help us understand how diverse factors um, combine to yield uh, observed patterns. So I say health disparities, but that's one application of it and a very important one. Um, Models are specific to purpose. I, I argued earlier models are like maps. Um, uh, models um, are like maps in two ways, um, at least two ways. One way is 
the, their simplification, some of the external system, and which simplification we use depends on our purposes. What map you use will depend on your purpose. If you want to get across Toronto um, via, um, via transit, you'll use one map. Uh, if you want to get it across it uh, with the with the light rail, use one map with the bus system, maybe you'd use another. If you want to get across it by bike, um, you'd be advised to use a different one or walking uh, a different one. If you want to figure out why there are brownouts in one area of Toronto, you would use a different map or, or why there's flooding, you'd use a different map. Yeah, maps are specific to purpose. What they leave out depends on what they're being used for. What they include depends on what they're being used for. Um, so it is with models. Um, models are specific to purpose. What they leave out, what they include is specific to the purpose. Multiple modeling types, system dynamics or compartmental, uh, agent-based modeling, discrete event simulation, offer complementary ways of describing processes. Um, and some of the greatest promise comes from, from hybrid approaches uh, thereof. Ladies and gentlemen, tools of system science tools to help us reason about what's going on in the world so that we can better interpret trends, we can better bend the curve, we can better change those, those, those observations, those trends. We can intervene. Um, after lunch, we will be exploring tools of data science equally rich, very important ways of starting with data from the world, making sense of it and noting its structure, noting its regularities, its orderliness in ways that then might clue us in ways to, to act on that data that's more reliable, to distinguish things that otherwise may look at first glance indistinguishable, to anticipate where things might be going. We'll look at those patterns from data science or those tools from data science. Um, and we'll do so with a lens towards bringing, of course, the two together starting tomorrow, synergizing the two. Um, so anyway, that's a, a bit of a glimpse of the tools of system science. Um, I will be posting, my plan is to do so here over lunch, 80 to 100 such models that you've seen. They span the gamut from models involving health service delivery to models involving chronic disease, models involving communicable infectious diseases, um, zoonoses, uh, uh, environmental epidemiology concerns, et cetera. Um, if, they find, if you find any of them of interest um, or you wanna learn more about them, um, feel free to reach out to myself or TAs. But before that, let's, uh, let's take a break. And we'll reconvene here uh, on the hour um, to continue our, our exploration this time with the data science lens. Thanks so much. And I look forward to seeing you shortly. Take care there. And TAs, I would ask that you, you stick on. So uh, actually, or, or we'll go to that other URL I sent so we can talk there. I do have one request uh, for people. Um,